Larry, thank you so much for giving me some time for this interview today for the Future Social Service Institute newsletter. Thank you very much for asking me. I'm delighted to be here. So, Larry, you've been the CEO at Family Safety Victoria since March this year and came to us from Wales, most recently before that, the CEO of the Welsh Women's Aid Organisation. That's right. Which I understand in our language, I don't think there's anywhere else in the world that calls them peak bodies, but relative to what we would understand, it's the national peak for domestic and sexual abuse organisations in Wales. It is interesting, that comparison between the UK and Australia about what peak bodies are. I remember the first time I went trying to understand what things were comparable. Yeah, it is, I would say, a peak body. It's um, a slightly different organisational structure. It's a federation, but it's a membership body for sexual violence, domestic abuse, violence against women, family violence services across the country. You've had about three decades of experience working in the specialist sector, public services and government to prevent and respond to violence against women. So your career demonstrates a very deep commitment to preventing violence against women and children. I'm curious, you came to Australia at the most extraordinary time and you arrived in Melbourne to this job just as we all went into lockdown. What is it that inspired you to move across the world to take up this role? Well, that's a great question. I think the first thing that drew me to Victoria was the ambition of the reform that's going on at the moment. As you said, I've been working for over three decades around prevention of violence against women, working in domestic abuse, sexual violence services, and and very much looking from Europe to other countries to see what works, what's going on in different parts of the globe, and have been following the work in Australia, but particularly in Victoria for quite a few years in relation to um, the work around prevention and the reform agenda and so on. So I was intrigued not only by the ambition of the reform, but also the significant investment that surpasses anything that we've seen in Europe or certainly in the UK into the response. And also having a government publish a long-term strategy, so a violence against women prevention, 10-year strategy and plan, whereas in my previous experience, most plans are three to four years, which is very much the political term. And really very curious about what could be achieved with all of those things in place at the same time. So having that parallel commitment to primary prevention as well as to investing significant resource into the response and also to a commitment to systems change, which I'm a big fan of in terms of focusing on that. And as you said, I was also very much looking forward to seeing Australia as well and seeing Victoria, but that hasn't quite gone according to plan since March. No. No. So given that you have been working remotely and haven't been able to see much of the country, what have you noticed since you started? Well, I think the first thing to notice is that Family Safety Victoria has achieved such a huge amount working with partner services, working with organisations across the state. And um, in July, it was its third anniversary. So in only three years, it's achieved such a lot. It's made a significant contribution in such a short space of time, which I'm really impressed by not only working with community services, but working with partners across a range of organisations and colleagues in academia and in the public sector and in the justice system and so on. And really very much built a sort of foundation for long-term change to prevent family violence. One of the things I'm particularly keen to find out more about and I've been also really impressed by is the focus on information sharing. So there's a lot of focus on information sharing in so many countries, but it's usually information sharing in relation to victim survivors and particularly children. But here we're also looking at information sharing in relation to perpetrator behaviour to inform risk management of perpetrators. And that alongside a 10-year industry plan, which is there not only to look at embedding best practice across the sector, but also looking to plan for the future capacity and meet the needs of the workforce in the future, I think is really, really important. Personally, I have to say, one of the things that drew me and one of the things that I've been really, really impressed by is the significant opportunity to stand alongside and work alongside Aboriginal community control services and work in Aboriginal communities. And I'm just hugely impressed, particularly by the work Family Safety Victoria has done with colleagues in the Aboriginal community sector. There's a Delta Jar partnership forum. There's a long-term plan to embed self-determination 
communication across that work and to have a holistic response to family violence and abuse, which is something I'm really keen to learn more about. It's something I'm really passionate about, making sure that we focus on diversity and diversity of voices and experiences across the board in anything that we do. And I think the thing that topped it off for me was the government having a Victim Survivors Advisory Council that they've set up to make sure that victim survivors' voices and experiences, diverse experiences, are really central to everything that's happening and everything that we do. I think that's really critical. It's been something that I've been prioritising in my career in several different places. And to have that here as well as a primary focus and a real priority for the Minister has been really important to me. Larry, until I moved back to Australia to take up this role, I was working across Asia. And I think one of the things that working internationally that I really noticed was how much I took with me about what I had learned from my Aboriginal colleagues and Aboriginal controlled organisations. I'm sure you've met Muriel Bamblett. I felt like Muriel, who is a dear friend and colleague, was sitting on my shoulder the whole time and really speaking to me and reminding me about a whole range of things from cultural competence and awareness and how firm and feisty and educated she is and all of the Aboriginal controlled organisations in that space. So I agree with you. I think it's one of the things that I came back to Australia for, the reform agenda and the government's commitment to it and working with Aboriginal controlled organisations. This is a really difficult time for everybody, as you say. I can't believe you've moved across the world, taken up such a significant role and been doing it in lockdown. And all of what I've been hearing about is with such integrity and grace. So welcome and thank you for that. What would you say? Thank you very very much. (laughs) Well, you are very warmly welcomed here by many people. What would you say to the leaders in the family violence during this incredibly challenging time? That's a really, really good question. And and I think it is incredibly challenging. I think it's important to remember also that leaders in the family violence sector have been working and dealing with the pandemic of violence against women and children, Mm -hmm. which is a global pandemic for decades, and now dealing with a double pandemic of COVID-19. So, uh, you know, the sector is used to, I think, going through hard times, but certainly this is a really testing time and, and quite unprecedented. I think it's important to focus on what your values are and make sure that your leadership values are there throughout in terms of your response. You know, it's not just for the good times that you focus on the values. It's important to make sure that they're embedded into your practice now more than ever. And I think it's really important to focus on, as I know our leaders are doing, staff care and safety um, of their teams, partners and organisations and families discussing with them regularly, you know, how we work together, how can we do business together better and adopting flexible work practices, which again, I've been hugely impressed by our leaders in the sector working across Victoria, really changing the practice very, very quickly to meet community needs and to meet their staff and colleagues needs. I would want to say to them to reach out for support from Family Safety Victoria and colleagues, very much recognising that the work that we need to get done is valuable, but the relationships between us and people that work in our organisations is really, really critical at this time. And we're here to offer practical support and practical help throughout this period. I think it's also important to remind ourselves that the leadership that's been really effective globally in responding to COVID-19 has been very much characterised by good communication and consultation and being evidence-based and not only having a compassionate approach, but also, you know, cooperating with each other, pulling together and working together. Now, coincidentally, a lot of those leaders have been women I think um, broadly evidence has shown but I think those principles and values underpin any approach I think you know will get us through these difficult times but I also think it's an opportunity and some of the conversations I've been having with leaders have been really interesting it's an opportunity to redefine what we want to see in the future redefine a new normal and particularly from a family violence context to think about what practical alternatives we can put into place how can we change systems what's our role now in promoting a more equitable society equitable community and and really embedding prevention in all that we do. And and how can we do things differently? What have we learned throughout this period? One of the things I'm particularly interested in is how we can invest in services differently, how we can make sure services in our communities are more sustainable and how those core functions in our services that we tend to assume, you know, just get done and happen. Those functions like, you know, data 
analysis and finance and governance and supervision and training, those core bits of our organisations, which are vital, are all really essential for direct service delivery in our communities. So it's really, really important. You know, we invest into sustainable long term community services and we can't do that in isolation. We have to work together on doing that. And I think the final message I would say is very much never forget why are we doing what we're doing from a family violence perspective? We are striving to end violence against women, family violence, sexual abuse. We're striving to have a more just and equal society as part of that because we know that inequality underpins family violence and abuse. And I think it's really important to bear that in mind. This is something that we've been working on for decades. This is something we know is not inevitable, however, and it's something that we know is preventable with the necessary will and and political resources and commitment, we can achieve that change. It may look different to what we've been used to, given the current double pandemic that we're dealing with, but it's something that I think we can get through as long as we work together on doing that. Hilary, that will be music to many people's ears, having the depth of experience and commitment and passion in the sector that you have. And I think your point about the values being at the core of what we do, regardless of whether it's good times or bad times, in fact, your values are what you need to draw on at the most difficult times. What has been fascinating talking to organisations and services is that point at the moment about the number of people I've heard talk about being united behind a common purpose and the energy that has unleashed to do things differently. You're right. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your long-term commitment, as you say, to this pandemic. That is a long-term fight that many of us have been committed to for a long time as well. We're very pleased to have you here and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much.